Hey students, welcome to the third lecture of Multiple Data Base and Mozilla Forms. So before we start, I want to recall a little bit what we did last time. So last time we did uh, section 1.2 where we talked about multiple zeta values and there we discussed that there are two ways to evaluate the product of two Riemann zeta values and write it in terms of um, double zeta values. And we also proved um, some linear relations among these numbers. And today we want to do section 1.3 where we talk about uh, modular forms and also um, introduce the so-called brotus kramer conjecture which gives the connection of the dimension of cusp forms and linear relations among double zeta values. So first a small review. So this was a definition of multiple zeta values where in this case here these k1 up to kr were uh, integers and this k1 uh, needs to be greater equal to 2 for the convergent of the sum and then we showed that these satisfy, for example, this linear relation that zeta 3 equals zeta 2, 1. And the product of two Riemann zeta values, meaning multiple zeta values in the case r equals 1, can be expressed in two ways by using the Staffel product, which just followed from the definition uh, of this iterated sum, and the Shuffle product, which you prove in the exercises by using partial fraction decomposition. And this gives a linear relation among double zeta values. And then we introduced the space of multiple zeta values, which we denote by this z. So this is uh, the q vector space spanned by all multiple zeta values, zeta k, where k is an admissible index. And therefore, um, k greater or equal to 0, we defined a subspace zk which were spanned by all multiple zeta values where the weight of the index, meaning the sum of the case, equals to this k. And then one of the main conjectures in this field is that the space z is graded by weight, meaning it's a direct sum of these z k's, which in other words just means that there are no linear relations among multiple zeta values of different weight. And then we saw this conjecture due to Zagier, who gave an explicit conjecture for the dimension of these spaces zk. And the conjecture is that they are given by these numbers dk, and these dk's were given by uh, this rational function here. And they also satisfied uh, some recursion formula. <coughs> and today we want to give a refinement of this conjecture due to um, Brotos and Kramer, and this will also lead um, to modular forms. So this will give a connection to modular forms. Modular forms. So we be, before we can state this conjecture, uh, we will do a crash course in the theory of modular forms. So. Let's start. So in this course, when we talk about modular forms, what we always mean are so-called modular forms uh, of level one. So there's a more general notion of modular forms, but in this course, we will just consider uh, modular forms of level one. So now, so what is a modular form? So a modular form is a function in the upper half plane. So first, let us denote by h the set oops, of all complex numbers tau such that the imaginary part is strictly greater than zero. So if this is a complex plane, this h is just the complex upper half plane here, where we do not include uh, the real axis here. And then the definition is, so for an integer k, Then a modular form is a holomorphic function. So a holomorphic function f. So by this here I mean the holomorphic function, the ring of holomorphic function in the upper half plane. And this is a modular form. 
particular form of weight uh, k, so this integer k, if, if it satisfies uh, two conditions. So the first condition is that it satisfies certain functional equation or certain symmetries and more precisely we want that for all matrices, 2 by 2 matrices A, B, C, D, which are matrices in <coughs> SO2Z and recall SO2Z are just the matrices where the entries are integers and where the determinant uh, is 1. And we want that for all these matrices we have the following equation, which is called the modular transformation, that f of a tau plus b <coughs> divided by c tau plus d equals, and now here, c tau plus d. And here, this is now the, the weight k, f of tau. And this should hold for all tau in H and also for all matrices, 2 by 2 matrices with integer entries and uh, determinant 1. So this is the first condition. <coughs> and the second condition is, which can be phrased in different ways, but one way is to say that F has a Fourier expansion. of the following form. So this means f of tau can be written as uh, the following sum and goes from 0 to infinity a n q to the n and here a n are some uh, complex numbers and this q is e to the 2 pi i tau. And this is called the Fourier expansion of f. And if f can be written like this, um, this is the second condition, and if it also satisfies uh, this transformation behavior, then this f is called a modular form of weight k. <coughs> so basically there are three conditions. f is a holomorphic function in the upper half plane, it satisfies uh, the modular transformation, and in, it has a Fourier expansion of this shape. <coughs> and then we denote by mk the c vector space spanned by all modular forms of weight k. Okay, so, so this condition here, this modular transformation, so it looks like you need to check this for infinitely many matrices. But uh, this is not uh, the case. So first, notice that this matrix, which is usually denoted by T, so this is an element in SL2Z. So if F is now a modular form of weight K, then if I take T for this matrix here, then this this equation here just says that f of tau plus 1 equals f of tau. And another matrix, which is usually denoted by s, so this also has determinant 1, so this is also an SO2z. And if you look now at this equation here, then this equation just says that f of minus 1 over tau equals tau to the power of k, uh, f of tau. So in particular, if f is a modular form of weight k, it should satisfy uh, these two conditions. But then in standard exercise is to show that SO2z as a group is actually generated uh, by these uh, two matrices. And this means since when this is a group action here on of SL to Z on the upper half plane, and then with some argument one can show that it's actually enough to
to show that f satisfies this condition, so meaning if f satisfies these two conditions, um, maybe let's write it like this, then it also already satisfies this for all matrices. So if, if you have a function where you want to check if it satisfies uh, these two conditions, it's just enough to check uh, these two conditions, because S of 2z is generated uh, by this matrix S and T. Okay. So now, um, because of this condition here, um, this means that, um, so first, um, let's consider this, this Q, which is e to the 2 pi i as a map from H, so it sends a tau to e to the 2 pi i tau, and the image of this, of the upper half plane under this map, is a punctured unit disk, which I denote by uh, d star here. So these are all um, complex numbers of absolute value between 1 and 0. So it sends the upper half plane to the complex uh, unit disk, but we don't include uh, the point uh, 0 there. So for example, the point 0 and 1, they both get mapped uh, to 1 here, and for example, a part here gets mapped to some ring segment like this, and for example, the part above this gets mapped to this uh, ring segment here. So if, if the function f satisfies this transformation property here, so it's uh, one periodic, so this means if I know the value of f in one of these strips here, then I also know the value of f in the others. So in other words, I could say that um, if f satisfies this property, then there exists a function a holomorphic function f tilde from the unit disk to C um, such that this f is just uh, the concatenation of the composition of these two maps q and uh, f tilde. So now <coughs> This f tilde is just a map from the punctured unit disk to C. And it's a holomorphic function. And now, so if you look at the second condition here, what does this actually say? This now says that f tau as a function in, in Q, so this is somehow now the f tilde, can be written as a, as a sum like this. And this just means that this f tilde can be analytically continued um, to the whole uh, open unit disk. So, so the number two just says um, f tilde can be analytically continued to uh, q equals zero. So this means that uh, f tilde is a function in z uh, can be written it's a Taylor expansion around zero, and this set is just then uh, the Q. So we can find a value of this um, f tilde at zero, and this is just the Fourier coefficient a zero. So, <clears throat> so another way we could phrase this here would be to say that if this function f would be bounded if tau goes to i infinity, this would mean that this if tilde is bounded in this uh, circle here. And then we now, due to a complex analysis, if I have a complex function, a holomorphic function, 
um, which is with some, in this case, if I have holomorphic function, which is uh, defined in this punctured disk here, and I know around zero it's bounded, then I can always uh, continue it to a holomorphic function in this point. So instead of saying that f has a Fourier expansion like this, you could also say that f tau is bounded as tau goes to i infinity. But maybe for us uh, this formulation will be more interesting. So uh, in our case we will do an example in a second. If we have a modular form it satisfies this condition here and we will be mainly interested in its Fourier expansion and the statement is just that f can be written as a power series like this where this q is e to the 2 pi i tau. And then there's also another notation. So if this value of f tilde in 0 is 0, so in other words if the value of this modular form uh, goes to 0 if tau goes to infinity, i infinity, so if a0 is 0, then f is called a cusp form. And we denote, or usually the space of cusp forms is denoted by sk. So these are all modular forms of weight k, such that f has a Fourier expansion which starts not at 0, but at 1. So the important point here is that this starts at 1 and not at 0. And maybe one comment, this letter S comes from the word German word for cusp, uh, which is uh, Spitze. So this means cusp. <coughs> okay, so now let's uh, think about an example for a modular form. So what is a function, a holomorphic function in the upper half plane, which satisfies these conditions? Well, one example would be the zero function, because of course for every k the zero function uh, satisfies this condition. And also it can be written like this by just saying all a n are zero. But um, maybe this is not the most interesting case. But for example, if k is zero, then this term here is one. And then an another example of a modular form of weight zero would be just uh, the con a constant function, because this would also satisfy uh, this condition here. And of course also this. But a more interesting example, the first non-trivial example, are so-called Eisenstein series. So they are defined like this. So first we will define these Eisenstein series for k greater or equal to 4 even, even though this sum here uh, makes sense for k strictly greater than 2 and also for odd k's, you see that this sum here vanishes for an odd k and later in the lecture we will also consider odd Eisenstein series which are not defined uh, like this. So in this case um, the condition for the convergence of this sum here is that this k is strictly greater than 2 and we define for an even integer k greater or equal to 4 gk of tau as a function like this. So it's a double sum over all integers m and n, which both shouldn't be 0 because otherwise we would divide by 0 here. And then we take the sum over 1 over m tau plus n to the power of k. And so first you can check that this is actually a holomorphic function in the upper half plane. So this sum converges for every tau in h. And but then you can also check that this gk for all k greater equal to 4 is a modular form of weight k. So you would need to check that uh, gk tau plus 1 is gk of tau. So this is one of these two conditions. 
and gk of minus 1 over tau is tau to the power of k, gk of tau. But if you do this substitution here in the sum, you will just see that you will make a change of basis of this lattice uh, z2, and then you, using the absolute conversion of the sum, you can re rearrange the sum and don't change anything, so you can check that this is again a gk of tau. And similar here, if you do this substitution in this part here, you can factor out this tau to the power of k, and again have a sum where you can, after change the order of summation, show that this is just gk of tau. And so this, um, so now we checked that this satisfies uh, this condition here, because we just need to check uh, these two for this. And then the second condition to be a modular form is that it has a Fourier expansion of a certain type. And in this case, we will see later um, for a more general object that the Fourier expansion of these Eisenstein series is given like this. So here, this a0 is just uh, the zeta value, zeta k, and the a1s are given by um, some, some power of pi, and this sigma k minus 1, and here this sigma k minus 1 of n is just the sum of all divisors of n to the k minus 1 power. So the Fourier coefficients uh, of these Eisenstein series have some uh, arithmetical interesting uh, object given by the sum of divisors of some integer n. Okay. <clears throat> so these are examples uh, for modular forms for all even weight k greater or equal to 4. And for odd weight, um, so first of all, notice that um, the negative identity matrix is also an element in S of 2z. And therefore, if f is a modular form of weight k, then, and you use this matrix in the first condition of the definition of modular form, you see that f of tau needs to be minus 1 to the power k uh, uh, f of tau. Therefore, if, if k is odd, this f has to be the zero function. So there, there are no modular forms uh, of odd weight except for the zero function. And now what I want to state is somehow the, the structure theorem of modular forms of level 1. And the statement is that these Eisenstein series, in particular just two of them, namely the case k equals 4 and k equals 6, are some of the building blocks of all modular forms. And the theorem is as follows. So the first statement <coughs> is that the space of modular forms of weight k is the direct sum of the space of Eisenstein series of weight k and cusp forms of weight k. So this statement is um, quite simple to show because if I have any modular form, so if f is a modular form of weight k, then it has some Fourier expansion starting with uh, some a0 uh, plus something And then, of course, I can write f as the, um, I take the Eisenstein series of weight k divided by zeta k. So this has constant term 1, and I multiply it by a0. So now I have constant term um, uh, a0. And if I would subtract this from there, and first you can show that the space of modular forms is a vector space, so this is again a modular form where the constant term is zero and therefore this is a cusp form of weight k. So this is an easy way to, to see this identity here. And then the second statement is if k is odd or negative or k is equal to 2, then the space of modular forms is just a zero space. So for odd, this we saw before. And for this, um, you need to use some complex analysis to show the statement and also in weight 0, we saw that constant functions are a modular form of weight 0. 
And using complex analysis, you can also show that these are the only fun modular forms of weight zero. And then the third statement, which uh, again just follows from the definition, you can check easily that if you have two modular forms of weight k1 and k2, then their product is again a modular form, and the, the weight of this modular form is just <coughs> k1 plus k2. And now these two Eisenstein series, g4 and g6, are algebraically independent, so there are no algebraic relations among them. And further, the space of all modular forms, which we, which is given by the sum of all these mk's, um, so you can also show that this is a graded algebra, so there are no linear relations among modular forms of different weight. And this is just given by the polynomial ring in G4 and G6. So in other words, every modular form um, can be written as a polynomial in G4 and G6. And another statement, um, which is not so trivial is that one can actually show that the space mk, the space of modular form of weight k, is generated by the Eisenstein series of weight k and products of just two Eisenstein series such that their weight adds up to k. So this is not a basis, um, so there are some relations among these, but the statement is that every modular form can be written as a linear combination of just products of two Eisenstein series and just one Eisenstein series. So this is somehow an, an overview of the structure of modular forms of level one. And for these statements, to prove this, uh, I give some references in the lecture notes, but it follows by using simple uh, complex analysis tools. And yes. So now I want to go to cusp forms more explicitly. So there's one famous cusp form, which is uh, called the delta function or the discriminant function or Ramanujan delta function. And one way to define this function, which we denote by delta tau, is given by this infinite product here. And again, here this, this q is uh, e to the 2 pi i tau. And here you see the, the Fourier expansion. And by the theorem before, you can also write this as something times uh, g4 squared tau uh, cube plus something uh, g6 square of tau, because every modular form um, is uh, a polynomial in these. And what I didn't say yet is that this is a cusp form of weight 12. And one can actually show that before weight 12, there are no non-trivial cusp forms. So this is actually the first non-trivial cusp form starting in weight 12. And also from this product expansion, <coughs> you can show that this delta, which is a function in the upper half plane, has no zero in the upper half plane. And using this, one can show that if I have a cusp form of some weight k, then I'm allowed to divide this cusp form by delta, and this will give a modular form of weight k minus 12. Because this delta doesn't have a zero in the upper half plane, and the zero of this delta in, in tau equals i infinity uh, we can read up here, it's, it has a zero of, of order one there. So if I have a cusp form, which means it also vanishes at infinity, so it at, at least has an order of a zero of order one. So therefore this expression here also makes sense for tau goes to i infinity. And so it could still be a cusp form, but in general it will be just a modular form of weight k minus 12. And this implies this following uh, fact here, that there is an isomorphism from the space of modular forms of weight k to the space of cusp forms of weight k plus 12, which is just given by multiplying this modular form with delta. And the argument is exactly this here. And with this, 
um, <clears throat> we can now consider the generating series of the dimension of cusp forms, which we will denote by SK. So this is the sum over all weights and the coefficient here is given by the dimension of SK. And due to the first theorem, this is just the dimension of the weight of modular forms shifted by weight 12. And due to this statement here, that a modular form of weight k is just a polynomial in G4 and G6, and G4 and G6 are algebraically independent, this means the the generating series of modular forms is given by 1 over 1 minus x to the power of 4 times 1 minus x to the power of 6. So this you can see by uh, writing this out using geometric series. And due to this factor, the dimension, the generating series of dimension of cusp forms is given by this rational function. Okay. And this was a super short uh, non-detailed crash course in modular forms. And the reason why we introduced this is because the name of the course is multiple zeta waves in modular forms, and we will use these Eisenstein series also in the next subsection. But here the goal was to actually introduce the generating series uh, of cusp forms, because they will appear now in, the, in this refined dimension conjecture due to Brotost and Kreimer. For multiple zeta waves. So now we will go back to multiple zeta waves and for this we first introduce some notation. So we want to state the dimension conjecture due to uh, David Broadhurst and Dirk Kreimer and for this they, they make, so this conjecture makes not just a statement about the dimension of the space of modular forms of weight k but also about weight k and depth um, r. So for this we first need to introduce the so-called depth filtration. So this d here stands for the depths. And by fill dr zk we mean the q-vector space spent by all multiple zeta waves of weight k and depths um, smaller equal to r. And then the um, associated graded part gr d r z k. So this is just a quotient. So I take the multiple zeta waves of weight k and depth smaller equal to r and I divide out the multiple zeta waves of weight k and r minus 1. And here we set uh, fill d 0 of zk to be q. So for example, so this space now um, is a space of multiple zeta waves of weight k uh, and depths r modulo multiple zeta waves of lower depths and same weight k. So for example, zeta 2 1 we proved is the same as zeta 3. So, so this means that the class of zeta 2 1 in this quotient space here is just 0. So this is 0 in depth 2 weight 3. And also if uh, zeta k, so that's k greater or equal to 2, if this would be a rational number, which we expect uh, that all of them are not rational numbers, but this would mean that uh, zeta k is 0 in d1 zk. But this we don't expect. by the conjecture we stated in the first lecture. But this is just an example to, um, to clarify this definition here. And now the Brotus-Kreimer conjecture makes a statement or makes a conjecture 
for the dimension of this part here. So it makes a conjecture for the dimension of the space of multiple zeta waves of weight k and modulo and depths r modulo lower depths. And the statement is the following. So the again we consider the generating series. So we consider now the generating series of this uh, space of multiple zeta waves of weight k, depths r modulo lower depths, and for the depths we take the variable y, and for the weight the variable x, and then the statement is that this generating series of these dimensions is given by this rational function here, which has uh, three ingredients, e, o, and s. So this e, if you write this out, this is just uh, using geometric series, it's just uh, even powers, and O is the odd powers starting in 3, and this S is what we saw before, is the space of cusp forms, or the dimension. And this starts with starting in weight 12, where we have the first uh, cusp form then the next form is in weight 16, and so on. And there's no one in weight 14 because we don't have a modular form of weight 2. Okay, so now um, we want to further understand what this uh, conjecture actually predicts. So again here it's written in a different form. So if you write out um, the right hand side, so the conjecture is that this equals the dimension of this space here, and if you write this out as a power series in, in y, then the first part you see here is um, uh, def 0, so this one says that the dimension, well maybe I don't do everything, in, so that the dimension of this d0 zero, that 0 should be 1, but this we know because this is the dimension of q as a q vector space, so this is just uh, 1. So this 1 makes sense and this is actually not a conjecture at this part. Um, but now let's take this one, so r equals 1. What does this state? Um, so the statement here is that the dimension of the def 1 objects modulo def 0, so modulo rational numbers, um, should be, uh, sh so this is the dimension of, let me write it. so this is the dimension of the space of Riemann zeta values. Well, in this case, it's just uh, q times zeta k modulo uh, q. And the conjecture states that this uh, should be 1. Because here um, we take exactly uh, the even ones and the odd ones, and for each uh, for each weight, we take just exactly 1. Of course, here this k should be uh, greater than, than 1, because this O doesn't contain uh, the, the monomial x, and also the Zeman, Riemann zeta value of weight 1 doesn't uh, exist. And so the conjecture is that this is 1, so in particular the statement is that these um, zeta values are all not rational, because otherwise the dimension of this space would be zero. Therefore, already the def1 part of the protos kramer conjecture is still, is still open. But now here we go to def2. So, so far it's everything uh, we, we had before, so nothing surprising. So in the depths 2, we now will need to distinguish between odd weight and even weight. So let's first consider 
the odd weight. So that the conjecture states that the dimension of the DEFS2 multiple zeta waves of weight k is given, so this is the conjecture, by the coefficient of x to the power of k uh, in, well, so how do we get uh, odd um, k here? The only possibility is to multiply this even uh, with this odd part here, because the others all give even, so it's uh, it's ex times ox. So this is the statement of the conjecture for odd weight that the dimension of this is given by the coefficient of this series here. So in what does this actually count? Is um, for example, it counts the products of even zeta values times odd zeta values. And this we can actually show, namely what we can show is that this space is spanned by products of zeta a times zeta b, where a greater or equal to 2 even and b greater or equal to 3 odd and a plus b equals k. So this uh, we can show that it's spanned by these objects, but uh, we also expect that these um, products of odd and even zeta values do not satisfy any linear relations, and they also don't satisfy any linear relations um, with uh, zeta k. So, um, so this here, uh, would actually imply, assuming this conjecture we had in the first lecture, uh, that they do not satisfy uh, linear relations. So, so expect no relations. And therefore, if this conjecture would be true, then also this part of the protoss kramer conjecture would be true. But this is somehow included in this uh, conjecture here. And also maybe another comment is that, um, so this you could um, multiply out by using the Staffel or the Shuffle product, so you get elements in DEFS2. And actually there's explicit formula how to write an, uh, an zeta value like, uh, so if A is even and B is odd, then there's an explicit formula um, how to write this in terms of, of these uh, products of Riemann zeta values. Okay, but now let's go to the even case. So when k is even, what is the statement of the brotos kramer conjecture here in DEFS2? The statement is that the dimension of this space of multiple zeta waves of depths uh, smaller equal to 2 and weight k is the coefficient of x to the k in, well, and then we have the remaining part here, odd times odd and this sx, so it's ox squared minus sx. And what do we know in this case? So we can show, and this we will do later in the lecture, in section 4, that this space is spanned by double zeta values a, b, where the, both of them are greater equal to 3 and odd, and a plus b is k. And the number of these generators are exactly given by the coefficient of x to the k in this ox 
squared, because if you multiply Ox by itself, then the coefficient of x to the k is exactly in how many ways? Uh, well, it counts exactly as these pairs of odd numbers adding up to k. But now the interesting part is that in the Brotus Kramer conjecture it says that the dimension is given by the number of these pairs minus the number of cusp forms in weight k. And this means um, that there should be relations among these zeta a, b, if a and b are odd, if there's a cusp form of weight k. And this, since the first cusp form um, starts in weight 12, should happen the first time in weight 12, and this um, we can show that we have the following relation, namely that so this is now a linear relation among double zeta values of weight 12. And so it's 168 times zeta 5, 7 plus 150 times zeta 7, 5 plus 28 times zeta 9, 3 equals and then some multiple um, of uh, zeta k. And in, in this uh, graded space here, this is just zero. So so this is zero in because we divide out uh, the single zeta value zeta 12. And this relation here is exactly the relation we can uh, we get here among these generators. So we can show that the space is spent by these zeta odd odds, but we can also show that for a cusp form there's a, for each cusp form there's a relation of this type. And this is due to a work of uh, Gangel, Kaneko and Zagi. They gave, um, so maybe, they gave the following explicit statement that um, for, um, that for, for every k, for every even k, the relations among these uh, zeta odd odds is at least given by the dimension of cusp forms of weight k. And they even make it uh, more explicit. So they, we will see, this we will do explicitly in, in section 4, that if we have a cusp form of weight k, we can assign to it a polynomial, the so-called period polynomial. So this will a priori be a polynomial with complex coefficient. But we can also make it such that these coefficients are rational. And using these uh, polynomials, we can use the coefficients of these polynomials to give explicit formulas for coefficients of these relations. So this will give relations. And combining the brotus kramer conjecture with their work, or also using, um, due to numerical experiments, a gang kenne konzagi conjecture, that um, there are no more relations among these zeta odd odds, meaning the number of relations among double zeta values of uh, with entries which are both odd is exactly given by the dimension of sk. And even if you forget um, this this graded part, so meaning without dividing something out, so this relation here, this zeta twelve one can also show, which was also done by Gangel, Kanek and Zagi, that in even weight k, the one-fourth of zeta k can always be written as a sum of all zeta uh, odd odd in this weight. And therefore, this relation here, we can replace the zeta 12 and get a purely a pure relation among just double zeta values of odd weight. And the conjecture is that relations of this type where you just have double zeta values where the entries are odd is exactly given by the number of cusp forms or the dimension of cusp forms in this weight. Yes. So and this, that's it for today. So next time uh, we will talk about uh, the more about these Eisenstein series and then also talk about so-called Q analogs. So we will mainly be interested in this um, Fourier expansion of Eisenstein series, which 
were given here. So in the next lecture we will study this Fourier expansion more and will be particularly in be interested in, in this tail here and we will show that this can be seen as something which is called a Q analog of uh, multiple zeta values and then we will generalize this to, to higher depths and talk about the algebraic structure a little bit of these objects. And maybe one last comment uh, which I forgot to say is that this conjecture here of Protoss and Krimer, if you would put this y to be 1, so then you again take all depths in a fixed weight k, so if you plug in y equals 1 here, what you get back is the conjecture um, of Zagi, which was given by this fact here, that here the should be the dimension of the space of that k, and if you set y equals to 1 in the protoss kramer conjecture, you get exactly uh, this part here. Okay, see you next time.